Coming up on this week in computer hardware, we got a bargain CPU and a heads up on memory prices. You might want to build that new desktop now. Huawei suing Verizon. Apple's not so cool for independent repair shops, and quite a few of you use AirDrop. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. This week in computer hardware is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Using the same password everywhere is a security nightmare waiting to happen. LastPass easily creates unique passwords for every site. Visit lastpass.com slash twit. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twitch, This Week Computer Hardware, episode 552, recorded on February 6th, 2020. It's time to build that new desktop right now. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show that aims to bring you the most delightful, most engaging, most useful, most affordable, most expensive, most unhinged. Mostly, we want to bring you the most performance for the least amount of money and all sorts of other things. We're trying to keep on top of the entire hardware industry. When I say we, I'm Patrick Norton, joined by Sebastian Peake, Editor-in-Chief, PC Per who has an absolutely gorgeous turntable lurking over his right shoulder. Yes. And, uh, I, I, I'm it, told it's real wood grain. I think it's a... Uh, they claim solid wood, wood laminate. It's, it's a laminate. It's a laminate, yeah. But it's There's nothing grain. wrong with medium-density fiberboard uh, for audio products until you get them wet or bump the corners against things. And then you have medium-density lumpy, chippy board. Mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. just depressing to think about. Um, are you using that turntable, or is it actually an object to art next to your cherry blossom painting? No, I'm using it. Uh, this is my current turntable because it's a lot, a lot less extravagant than the turntables I've used in the last decade where I felt that it was not even safe to have them out with my toddler running around. So <laughs> I told my wife, I have to get another turntable because I need one with like a standard hinged lid right. and you know i had a vpi scout for a while um and a couple of other similarly expensive turntables that don't have any kind of dust cover and especially the, the scout freaked me out when my son was born i'm like i can't keep this when he starts to walk because i don't know if you know that turntable at all it has a unipivot tone arm where the tone arm is literally balanced on what looks like a steel needle and it's not yeah. connected to the turntable in any way. So you bump I was gonna the, say the thing the that motor it's on for it. the Scout. Isn't the motor for the Scout like a separate module that you sort of place next to the Scout itself? Yes. It's it only connected like it, yeah. to the Scout with a belt. It's an outboard motor. <laughs> Has a unipivot tone arm that's held by these like hair, like these little ultra thin wires that you could break. I don't know if by Kevin can see the, the, the link I just dropped him. It's a beautiful turntable. It is legendary, but I can think of nothing more frightful to have with a small child around. <laughs> yeah. Because you can make what? everything go wrong by touching any part of it. You um, can utterly destroy it by looking at it the wrong way, I think. And I had a previous version <laughs> of it that didn't have quite that uh, wide base or the big feet they added to it. Mine had these little conical feet. But that tone arm, man, you can just lift it up with a finger and it's off of the turntable. So it had to go. Where's daddy's tone arm? Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Somewhere it's out in the, the backyard, half buried in the flower bed. Yay. Use it for my robot. Oh, my goodness. Uh, in other strange and wondrous news that's kind of about hardware, but not generally about the hardware you're probably listening for, I was in a Radio Shack today and bought like a old school, but not as old school as I would have liked, uh, weather monitor, which always makes me happy. <laughs> Where <laughs> are you that there's a Radio Shack, A? I didn't know there were any left. Uh, Colorado. I thought it was... There's at least one left. There's more than one left, but uh, it was oh. highly amusing for me to walk into a Radio Shack. Uh, oh, my goodness. And uh, for more of the news you're actually probably here for, or to turn to the sort of hardware news you probably listen to or watch this week in computer hardware for, uh, the general consensus uh, is that you probably want to buy your SSDs, your memory now, if you're thinking about building a new system. Uh, Jeremy Hellstrom pulled together a nice write-up upon PC Per, and uh, as he points out, Memory prices have been up and down and all over the place in the last couple of years. And uh, the big news right now is that uh, data center 
data center build outs and 5G devices, which are mostly high end devices, which consume a tremendous amount of memory because why not put 12 gigabytes of RAM on a phone that can only use four um, is starting to increase demand for memory, which means whenever memory goes, uh, memory demand goes up, prices tend to scale. Um, there's a nice uh, link in that article to the original report on the register, uh, which includes a quote from John Newfer, president and chief exec of SIA. The global market rebounded somewhat during the second half of 2019, increasing slightly from Q3 to Q4, and modest annual growth is projected for 2020, uh, which is a polite way of saying that uh, all the companies that got their asses handed to them in the last year, SK Hynix, Micron, uh, Samsung, uh, I mean, SK Hynix and Micron were down like 33% in revenue. Uh, but you can expect as demand goes up, they will start making more money, and that will cause them to bring up a bit of uh, a bit of uh, more revenue. What's kind of crazy? Uh, so the SIA, the Semiconductor Industry Association, um, they said memory, basically global revenues for memory. We're down, quote, 12% year-on-year to $412 billion, the biggest drop since the dot-com bust in 2001. And I'm quoting uh, Robbie Harb at the register on that one. So if you're thinking about that 32 or 64 or 128 gigabyte memory upgrade or you've been eyeballing a new SSD, might want to punch the button on Amazon or Newegg now rather than waiting till later this year. So Yeah, I was, go- I was going to add, you know – we are the last people you're ever going to listen to come up with some sort of a cynical uh, take on this. Uh, but, you know, we heard some highly publicized stories about the issues that DRAM manufacturers were having last year. And lo and behold, mm-hmm. here in 2020, ah, the prices, they might be going up. You know, those problems we had with production last year as they stockpile like warehouses full of these NAND ships. But hey, I, it, that's just speculation on my part. But I, do, I would not be surprised at all if the prices go up again. It's like gasoline. Well, I mean, Buy it when it's cheap because it might be $3 a gallon higher tomorrow. You know. I remember there was a rural cooperative where you could buy your gasoline you know, on futures. And my favorite story was this, this uh, wise elder member of the community who 20 years before had bought like 10,000 gallons worth of gasoline up front. And so she basically had her lifetime supply of gasoline for 85 cents a gallon. So, you know, gasoline hit $4, but she was still working off the 10,000, you know, gallons worth of gasoline she'd pre-purchased in like, you know, 1980-something. Uh, if you are thinking about buying a uh, an SSD, um, looking at basic uh, SATA SSDs, you know, you're talking about 216 bucks for a 2-terabyte SSD, which is the lowest I've ever seen that. Um, 210 bucks for a Crucial MX500, 216 bucks for a Samsung 860 Evo. Uh, prices are very, very good, and even NVMe prices are down a lot. So, not a bad time to buy a new hard drive if you're thinking about storage, which makes me so happy. <laughs> um, so, Windows Search went down yesterday for an extended period of time. What uh, what was going on with that, Sebastian? Well, Microsoft officially says that it was a outage on their side. Mm-hmm. Um, was the third-party networking fiber provider that experienced a network interruption is how they put it. And we were looking at I was looking at this report from Computer World and it's kind of interesting because they go through uh, several different scenarios, possible, explanations of this because here's the thing windows search windows 10 search is not supposed to be this online thing that requires an active internet connection because you can use it to search you know your own computer look for applications on your computer and that wasn't working either you couldn't search for anything yesterday it just brought up a blank uh, start menu basically with nothing in it and i've actually had this happen before but I've also, you know, experimented with intentionally creating outages of Microsoft servers in my home through blacklists. So <laughs> it's good to have a hobby. It, yeah. So depending on what build you were running or what updates may have come down from Microsoft, you might have been unable to use search at all. And it's it's good. Uh, it's a good read. Uh, I would look this over if you're interested in in the explanation because it, it's been restored at this point. So, you know. 
right. problem is gone, no worries. It's just interesting to think that Microsoft may be changing things on their side and sending these updates down to you, even if no official updates have been downloaded on your PC, even if there were no patches. And the funny thing is they fixed this on their end without sending any patches down. So your system is fine. It's still running the same build as it was yesterday. It's just that now suddenly search, which doesn't require an internet connection, works when it didn't yesterday. So, and there was a fix yesterday uh, too. I follow uh, Paul Thrott on Twitter, who of course runs Windows Weekly Podcast here. And uh, I believe it was uh, Rafael Rivera who uh, worked with him for a long time on his Windows Bibles, who posted, I know a lot of people were posting this yesterday, but there were certain uh, D word values you had to change in the Windows registry to get this working yesterday. And it, it was kind of funny, possibly coincidental that it involved Bing, but it's just suggestive that maybe there's data collection analytics tied in with even local Windows search and an outage exposed that a little bit yesterday. Um, Microsoft, Microsoft, of course, is not saying this. They're, when this is all conjecture. And a lot of the Computer World article I'm referencing was also technically conjecture as well. It's just, you know, at some point it's an educated guess, I think. Right. Doesn't mean we have to like it. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's Windows as a service. I just need to get used to it and stop complaining. I'm just this rigidly old school person who thinks if you purchase and install software locally on your machine and do local things and only and the internet is sort of this sandboxed thing within a browser that right. I'm not especially excited about the idea that there is data going back and forth and a network outage on Microsoft's side or one of their third-party providers, as they said, could prevent me from doing something that's intrinsic to my actual use of my own machine. But I actually use Windows Search a lot more than I think about because I'm just like, it's a keystroke and then you're typing and then your thing comes up, so. Well, that's, I mean, it's it's interesting you mentioned that because we got got an email from... uh, our listener chips and uh, let me uh, move that up in the rundown so Kevin can grab the link for that one. Um, in Ars Technica, the, I'm just going to read the headline here. Um, Agit Pi, carrier sales of phone location data is illegal FCC plans punishment. Um, and anybody who listens to the podcast regularly knows I'm not the hugest fan of, of uh, Chairman Pi, but uh, uh he flat out told lawmakers, quote, that one or more wireless carriers violated U.S. law. So, and, uh, you know, the, the letter he wrote to Democratic members of Congress who asked for an update on the probe, and again, I, I want to make it clear that I'm quoting the article from John Brodkin up on Ars Technica. Um, the FCC's Enforcement Bureau has completed its extensive investigation, and it has concluded that one or more wireless carriers apparently violated federal law. So... Accordingly, in the coming days, I plan to circulate to my fellow commissioners for their consideration one or more notices of apparent liability for forfeiture in connection with the apparent violations. And uh, it's interesting. AT says AT and T was, of course, claimed that selling location data was okay. <laughs> we didn't do anything wrong. So, uh, what is kind of crazy is apparently uh, uh, they continue to sell data after they had promised to stop. So, interesting article there in. Uh, you know, it's not that. Uh, it's it's I I don't. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you possibly nothing. spin this in any positive way? Well, you just flat out deny. That's what AT and T likes to do. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, works. Anyhow, thanks for the thanks for the links to that one. Chips, uh, as you know, all right, go watch it. Punish them. Make them suffer. And uh, tell find them to be more honest find about them their coverage. Thousand dollars. <laughs> it'll it'll really hurt yeah. them. Those, those While you're at it, bring AT and T to its knees. Yeah, you can maybe maybe tell them to, to cut the unlimited claims, uh, and uh, unless they're actually offering unlimited full speed data, and maybe I don't know, get more legit with their coverage maps. Uh, <laughs> shifting gears slightly. There's no bitterness um, there at all. I didn't detect it. None. No. Why? Why would I be bitter? Um, exactly. We're being, we're positive here. We're a positive pair. So- Fellows, and you're positive that you have an incredible budget CPU. 
Oh yeah, and this I have thought about buying one of these because you know it's not what like AMD started resampling the Ryzen 5 1600, which we got you know long ago when that launched. But if we we talked about this recently, the AF variant. So if you're shopping and you see a Ryzen 5 1600 for around eighty five dollars, mm-hmm. check the description, see if it actually has the model number. Like if you can go into a brick and mortar store, great, because you can look at it right. and you could verify this. But online, I know Amazon, the listings for this show it. It's YD sixteen hundred BBAF BOX. That's the boxed processor model number. And if you find one of these, that is actually a Ryzen 5 2600 with very slightly reduced clock speeds because they they basically moved off of their 14 nanometer process. They moved over to 12 nanometer Zen Plus to continue making the Ryzen 5 1600. This allows them to hit that price point. They're around the 80 to 100 dollar price point with this, depending on where you go. Uh, TechSpot just did a review of this um, at the end of last month, and it's funny to look at these charts and see just how close it is to a Ryzen 5 2600. And that, you know, obviously it's because it's the same thing. It's just, you know, 100 megahertz slower, which you could probably take care of with a simple overclock. But, yeah, just another reminder of PSA that if you are looking for a budget CPU, how could you possibly go wrong with about an $85 six-core 12-thread CPU? And it's it's not like it's two or three generations old at this point. It's last year's Zen Plus architecture. No, it's not as fast as, as Zen 2. But for the money, I don't think there's anything better out there. There you have it. Exactly. That's about as cheerful as we're going to get. Actually, uh, Apple sold a ton of watches this year. Um, we don't, uh, the whole sort of Android side of the smartwatch market kind of fell off. But uh, this is kind of crazy. The Verge was writing about this. Um, Apple shipped 30.7 million watches worldwide in 2019. Uh, the entire Swiss watch industry sold 21.1 million units. Uh, one of those companies was up 36. One of the one of the company mentioned in that line was up 36 percent year over year, uh, while the nation or the national industry mentioned in that quote was down 13 percent year over year. Um, you know that's. Uh, you know, I, it, it would be interesting to see like what the total number of watches sold in the United States was, period, because uh, I'm pretty sure a small percentage of those are actually Swiss watches. But, uh, you know, that's uh, uh, that's a lot of watches, um, a lot more uh, than I would have yeah. thought. I, I noticed uh, something last year that I, I hadn't really – the Apple Watch wasn't really on my radar when it came out, and I've never been a smart watch sure. uh, customer But then I I started to notice that virtually every holiday, real or imagined, there was an Apple Watch sale Mm -hmm. on Amazon and Best Buy and other places. And it's like $75 off, really? And that gets pretty affordable. And then last year's watches started getting heavily discounted. It got to the point where you could buy an Apple Watch for $199 or even $160 if you got a Series uh, 3 when the Series 4s were out. Right. And I ended up giving one to my wife, I think, last year at valentine's day or something or maybe it was mother's day and I'm like it suddenly became this attractive and not outrageously expensive uh it's it's less of a luxury item than i used to uh, assume it to be like when it first came out it was you know a four or five hundred dollar watch and now it's eh, two three hundred bucks <laughs> does a lot of stuff it's like a really really fancy fitbit plus other things and app integration if you use an ios device and I have one, and honestly, the thing I use it for the most is my pause and go back 30 seconds device. So, like, you know, I'm listening to something, and like, oh, there's a pause button right on my wrist. That's convenient. Because, of course, I'm walking around with AirPods because I'm the sucker who's completely in that whole Apple ecosystem. I can't believe you're on AirPods. <laughs> I have, and you know what? I was thinking about this a couple days ago because I was listening to some music. Actually... It was the Blade Runner soundtrack, which I've never attempted to listen to this way. And I'm like, oh, hey, I forgot I put that on my phone because I also am the weird person who has music locally on my device. And it sounded really bad. Like, 
terrible. It was lossless, and it sounded like 128K MP3. And I'm how is this so bad? But I, I only ever listen to spoken words, so I don't notice it as much. Listening to podcasts and audiobooks and stuff. Which is, you know, that's what I use my iPhone for. It's my audiobook slash podcast player that does iMessage so my wife doesn't complain about me not having iMessage. Hmm. Are we talking about something else? We're talking about watches. We were talking no about more about watches. my shameful adoption <laughs> Your of the shameful entire app AirPod habits. <laughs> Well, we'll shift gears for your personal safety and self-esteem. Uh, Chinese phone manufacturers are working on an end run around the Google's Play Store. Uh, Reuters has the exclusive on this. Uh, Xiaomi, Huawei, Oppo, and Vivo are creating a platform, quote, to let developers outside China upload apps onto all of their app stores simultaneously. Uh, Huawei, of course, probably having the largest amount of skin in that particular game. Um, this is pretty much them sticking a fork in the general direction of Google uh, and the United States. Um, but what they're, the idea is that it's the Global Developers, Developer Service Alliance. And uh, Reuters writes, the platform aims to make it easier for developers of games, music, movies, and other apps to market their apps in overseas markets. So, uh, and apparently they're going to cover... Nine, quote, regions, unquote, uh, including India, Indonesia, and Russia. So, and in case you were wondering, Oppo and Vivo, both owned by BBK Electronics, the Chinese manufacturer, and all, quote, four companies declined to comment for this story. <laughs> so, um, this doesn't surprise me. Google services, of course, are banned in China, and... Uh, uh, it is uh, the, the Google Play Store is a huge source of revenue for Google. Um, I'm, uh, you know, it's yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. Um, one of the uh, analysts that was quoted in the story, Nicole Peng, uh, says, "Quote: By forming this alliance, each company will be looking to leverage the other's advantages in different regions. With Xiaomi strong user base in India, Vivo and Oppo in Southeast Asia, and Huawei in Europe." Secondly. It's to start to build some more negotiation power against Google, she added. Um, and those companies together is like 40% of the handsets that are shipped in the world. No comment from Google that I'm aware of. So, and, uh, you know. Not, not surprising. <laughs> We're not going to use you. Yeah, okay. Enjoy that. Yeah. We'll, we'll take the rest of the world. You can have... Yeah. You can have your home country. Well, India is, I mean, I want to say, like, I think flagship smartphone sales are up like 30% in India. India is a huge market. And, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. There's tremendous revenue opportunities there. So I don't think Google's quite going to take this one laying down. Um, the other thing that came up in our continuing coverage of strange and wondrous hardware battles involving Huawei is uh, they just decided to sue Verizon for. Well, they basically say Verizon's using 12 of their patents without authorization, i.e. payments. Um, so the quote writes The Verge, uh, uh, I should say writes Sam Byford over at The Verge, quote, uh, where did it go? The lawsuit filed in the Eastern Western District Courts in Texas claims that Verizon is using 12 patents owned by Huawei without authorization. Uh, the patents relate to network technology with titles like sending method, receiving and processing method, and apparatus for adapting payload bandwidth for data transmission. So, uh, one of the things about Huawei is, is that I didn't realize is they, they spent about 15% of the company's revenue on R&D expenditure, which in 2018 was about $15 billion. Um, and uh, the company, in their statement, writes that since 2015, Huawei has received more than $1.4 billion in patent license fees. To date, it has also paid over $6 billion for the legitimate use of patented technologies developed by industry peers. 80% of these license fees have gone to companies in the United States. Poke, poke, poke. So, and uh, other cheerful news involving uh, legal negotiations. Uh, Vice has a really interesting write-up, uh, or depressing if you prefer, uh, Motherboard, which is the, the, the tech coverage that Vice runs, um, was a really good article where they got a copy of the contract that was put together for the independent repair program. Uh, and if you're watching the video, you're seeing something scroll by that says, Apple's independent repair program is invasive to shops and their customers, contract shows. And what's kind of crazy about that 
is, you know, the subhead on that is the contract states independent repair shops must agree to audits and inspections by Apple, even if they leave the program. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, and what? it's frustrating. So, yeah. <laughs> well, so if, so if Apple, Apple created parts are in your building, they have the right to come in and inspect you. Is that what they're saying? Loosely translated. I have not read the original document itself. So, so the independent repair uh, provider program, um, which was the idea. It was cool, right? They said, oh my goodness, Apple's going to let independent repair shops, they're going to you know, provide them with, well, they're going to sell them parts and tools, diagnostic services, because there's a lot of stuff that's really difficult to do in terms of some of the deeper iPhone repairs or iPad repairs. Um, you know, the, the, the quote that I particularly like by Maddie Stone uh, over at Vice, uh, quote, it contains terms that lawyers and repair advocates described as onerous and crazy, terms that could give Apple significant control over businesses that choose to participate. Concerningly, the contract is also invasive from a consumer privacy standpoint. Um, you know, and uh, of course, first you sign the the – you know, people with knowledge of the situation uh, basically say that first you sign a non-disclosure agreement with Apple, and then you get a copy of the contract. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, that doesn't sound in order to join at the all. program. The contract states independent repair shops must agree to unannounced audits and inspections by Apple, which are intended, at least in part, to search for and identify the use of quote prohibited unquote repair parts which Apple can impose fines for. If they leave the program, Apple reserves the right to continue inspecting repair shops for up to five years after a repair shop leaves the program. Apple also requires repair shops in the program to share information about their customers at Apple's request, including names, phone numbers, and home addresses. Uh, it's very strange. I get while you're involved in the program being subject to inspection because – Somebody could set this up. They could be, oh, yeah, you're, we're a trusted partner. We only use official Apple uh, repair parts. You'll get a genuine Apple iPhone screen when you break your screen, et cetera. And then order yeah. just the cheap stuff. It's not even using Gorilla Glass and garbage parts. But five years after you leave the program sounds very strange. Are well, they briefing these people on Apple's upcoming products? <laughs> Five-year roadmap, well, NDA, can't talk about it. Well, the independent repair program members also, they have to, uh, quote, uh, get express written knowledge, excuse me, express written acknowledgement that customers understand that they are not receiving repairs from an authorized service provider. Um, so, you know, that's like basically if you go to an independent repair shop, if you go to Midas for your muffler, <laughs> and Midas makes right. you sign a document that says that, you know, this is not an authorized service provider. Um, this is kind of depressing. Yes. Um, so, you know, the basically, I mean, you're right, right? Prohibited products are counterfeit products or service parts uh, or ones that infringe on Apple's intellectual property. Um, what exactly that means is really interesting and kind of uh, uh, poorly documented and difficult to determine. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, on one hand, Apple's trying to maintain standards. On the other hand, Apple, of course, is making it more difficult for people to keep Apple products. Well, maybe I'm being maybe I'm being too harsh, Sebastian. Apple's just trying to look out for its customers. Yeah. yeah they, they know what's best. And what's best is just buying a delete expletive new iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> At least they're not giving you a kill switch for a 30% discount. Oh, my goodness. I want to thank everybody for listening and supporting This Week in Computer Hardware. Um, you may know that we are part of the twit.tv network, and Twitter has a whole bunch of shows. And one you might not know about, one of our newest podcasts, is Smart Tech Today. Uh, Micah Sargent, Matthew Cassinelli uh, are co-hosting that one. And the goal, there they want you to suffer less. They want, they want to help you make sense of the devices in your life and if they're worth it, right? Basically, they want to help you learn all about the Internet of Things. Uh, smart Take Today is great for learning about all the Internet of Things, from the smart car to smart refrigerators. New episodes are available every Monday. So subscribe to Smart Tech Today on your favorite podcast or visit our website at twit.tv slash stt. Let me say that one more time, twit.tv slash stt. And thank you again for listening. 
Search that on your favorite podcatcher. Oh my goodness, <laughs> the internet of yeah, stuff. Yeah, better be better them than us. That's good. It's a valuable service <laughs> because hey, isn't like ninety nine percent of stuff at a like a Best Buy internet enabled now? So, and then I don't trust Amazon reviews of anything anymore. So I we need these objective looks at things so we know what the heck is going on. Well, there you have it. Uh, while we're talking about the Internet of Things, one of the uh, most popular tools in the creative industries, uh, if you draw, if you're a Photoshop maven, uh, you probably spend a lot of time with the Wacom tablets. Robert Heaton is a software engineer slash researcher. Um, found that Wacom tablets uh, track the name of every application open on a user's computer and send that information, that data, to Google Analytics. Um, oh. Why? Yeah. Every story today, it seems, it's just more and more depressing <laughs> as we go along. I like the drawing he did. That is With nice. The, did yeah, he do that on up. one of these drawing tablets? He has a Wacom drawing tablet. He uses it to draw cover illustrations for his blog post, oh, okay. such as nice. this okay. one. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Uh, I, I won't crit yeah. critique his um, his particular style. <laughs> That's not what we're here well, for. It, it's funny, right? He was he was uh, he was installing uh, his tablet on a new laptop, and. He basically says, look, I never usually, quote, I never usually read privacy policies. Instead, I vigorously hammer the yes button in an effort to reach the game machine or medical advice on the other side of the agreement as fast as possible. But Wacom's request made me pause. Why does a device that is essentially a mouse need a privacy policy? Sensing skullduggery, I decided to make an exception to my anti-privacy policy, policy, policy. Well, he says policy twice and give this one a read. Uh, quote, in Wacom's defense, that's the only time you're going to see that phrase today. The document was short and clear, although, as we'll see, it wasn't entirely open about its more dubious intentions. In addition, despite its attempts to look like the kind of compulsory agreement that must be accepted in order to unlock the product behind it, as far as I can tell, anyone with the presence of mind to decline it could do so with no adverse consequences. And, uh, so yeah, basically the policy, the 3.1, section 3.1 of the privacy policy, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it asks if you can send information to Google Analytics, quote, including aggregate usage data, technical session information, and information about my hardware device. So, yeah. So he started snooping on the snoopers and uh, getting his wire shark on. It's a good article. Uh, RobertHeaton.com is the website Wacom Dropping Tablets track name of every application you open is the name of the article and it's a good read. So I don't know. You ready to answer a question about uh, about Thunderbolt 3? Okay. Mr. Peak. Jeff emailed Twitch at twit.tv about Thunderbolt 3 and eventually I suppose 4. He, he says... Uh, this confuses me some with Thunderbolt 3 already supporting two monitors at up to 4K 60 hertz. Will people still need graphics card at all soon? I've got to be missing something. Sorry for the dumb question. It seems like I, if I can currently connect two 4K monitors to a Thunderbolt 3 port on several motherboards now, it won't be long before there is no need for graphics cards. As the new generations of the Thunderbolt connection come out and support higher frame rates still in resolutions, will graphic cards go away? The Thunderbolt monitors out are still fairly spendy but like anything it seems they will come down in price is that the main issue currently thanks jeff and the thing about thunderbolt uh three and eventually four uh is that it's it's a connection it's a cable it's an interface right. whereas the marketing folks like to say at thunderbolttechnology.net the usb-c that does it all uh, it doesn't actually generate the graphics. Um, the gpu right. integrated into the cpu on your laptop or your desktop motherboard generates the pixels that gets shoved over the Thunderbolt 3 connection. For it's example, a, if you have a it's Ryzen... It's just a pixel pipe. Yeah. Yes. It's Something's the tube. creating the <laughs> those pixels, but then they go through this tunnel yeah. uh, by which, yes, it does support to... I'm not, we're not trying to be facetious here, and I should just stop talking and let Patrick explain yeah. this. He was doing a great job. No, no, no. 
well, you know, jump in at any time, right? But right, you know, rising the majority of Ryzen CPUs last time I checked did not have integrated GPUs, right? So you are Ryzen correct. desktops are going to need GPUs. Um, most Intel CPUs have really meh 3D performance. Um, which, if you don't care about 3D performance, you can use the onboard graphics built into your CPU and whisk those pixels over the Thunderbolt 3 or eventually 4 connection to your monitor, which can be chained with you know external drives and closures and power and a whole bunch of other stuff. Thunderbolt 3 is essentially, you know, as much as I'm on to to you know giggle about the USB-C that does it all, but the idea is that eventually you can have one port on your laptop full-on Johnny Ives Apple style and have it connect to all of the things you need. Uh, in reality, sometimes this works better than other times. Um, but it's it's when it works, it's pretty slick, right? Um, yeah. But if you need to speed up apps like Photoshop or Premiere, if you want to do 3D gaming, you are going to need a GPU. For the folks that don't need 3D performance, uh, the onboard GPU or I should say the, the built-in GPU in your CPU feeding over Thunderbolt 3 or 4 is going to be just fine, which is probably the vast majority of, of laptop users and probably desktop users these days. Yeah. Eh, maybe not think desktop about, users. Think about Thunderbolt as the best we have so far at this ideal goal where I.O., like in, input-output on your device, is just a direct connection to the CPU. You want to eliminate as right. much overhead as possible. You're not going through an additional chipset. It's like having external PCI Express lanes, essentially. Yeah. It, at its, I think that's where they would love it to be, is that, oh, you know, that, this is the same as either four or eight lanes of PCI Express, whatever generation. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting anything more by having a Thunderbolt connection than a better and more direct connection to the hardware you already have. So if your CPU, if you check it out and your CPU's graphics only support 4K 30, Thunderbolt's right. not going to help you get to dual 4K60 monitors. That is the result of a much more advanced graphic solution in that CPU that is then, uh, you know, you can tap into it through Thunderbolt. But unlike things we've seen, like there are definitely USB external monitors. There are things that generate their own uh, display and just need a data connection. But again, that's, I mean, that's more of like a software solution. That's not actually something that would really be viable for gaming or any kind of uh, hardcore application usage. It's a great way to get a secondary display for other things. But their GPUs say, still have their place, for sure. Yeah. No, I've, I've actually been really enjoying the, the video. If you're watching the video, the video that you're watching is from the... Uh, uh, the the Thunderbolt uh, technology dot net kind of like the the marketing page for Thunderbolt and uh, you know when it works it's really slick so like forty gigabits per second from your external drive to your device and you can connect four K to it and it can connect to speakers and it's um, it's slick right one cable to rule them all and in the darkness bind them <laughs> so why did yeah, you have to make Jeff, this dark <laughs> that wasn't dark. <laughs> Well, maybe uh, I mean, dark. the one ring has some, I mean, it, it can do good or it can totally it can. consume you and, and devour your soul. Well, I'm pretty sure Thunderbolt 3 will not devour your soul, at least in any iteration I've seen. Uh, we asked people to res to email Twitch at Twitter.tv if they used AirDrop and uh, we got some great responses. Andrew writes to Twitch at Twitter.tv, AirDrop is fantastic. I used it once during a department meeting three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, that was like my story, yeah. Yeah. Uh, while discussing some photos taken it, it during an fantastic. audit. It was. It, well, it, and and, and uh, Andrew writes, uh, while discussing some photos taken during an audit, a coworker said, hold on, I can airdrop the pictures to your iPad. This confused half the room, but everyone perked up, and since all of our company phones are Apple, they each turned on airdrop. After sending the five or so pictures that were necessary, we spent the next hour during the meeting silently dropping pictures on each other's devices in a complete waste of company time, much like the eight hours we spent in the conference room, but that's a different discussion. He says, I haven't used it since. Thomas says, Patrick and Sebastian, I regularly use AirDrop to share my pre-saved contact info, usually to new business acquaintances. I usually have to teach people how to turn it on to receive from everyone that's not in their contacts list, except the contact card, tap save, then switch back to contacts only. The most common response is, oh, that's cool. I didn't know you could do that. This is much easier than the old days before iPhone of trying to pair phones via Bluetooth and attempting to share contact info. 
It's also great for even sending photos and videos to my wife rather than having all that extra data in our messages. And I'll admit, I may not have been the first, but I thought of it on my own. I've sent family friendly memes to random people at the airport who have left their airdrop turned on to accept from everyone. I call it air bomb, <laughs> right. like photo bomb. Thomas, you're awesome. Thanks for years of expertise and entertainment, and thanks for helping me out on T. Uh, TNSS episode 152 and you are so welcome Thomas um, Jacob emailed from Stockholm hi I didn't know we had listeners in Stockholm it's very exciting he says I just wanted to weigh in and state that it is my preferred method of sharing pictures after a party or family get together pros fast easy and full quality pictures cons only for iOS users not everyone knows of it or understands it can easily create duplicates in your photo library here in Sweden the iPhone has a fairly huge market share so most people have iPhones meaning it's definitely a viable option to use AirDrop I've only used it for anything other than sharing videos and pictures less than a handful of times though best regards and huge thanks for an awesome show Jacob thanks man Finally, Kevin writes, just to add a data point, I use AirDrop daily to share high-quality photos and videos with friends, also links and other files. As long as they're close by, AirDrop is preferred. There you have it. Yeah, it is. I I wasn't trying to diminish its uh, importance last week for sure, and I yes, loved all the responses. I think we've got more responses about this than anything in the year or so I've been doing this. But it's it's one <laughs> of those things where it's it's fantastic, and you have to – go into full-on presentation mode to teach somebody that it exists, how to access it. What are you talking about again? AirDrop? Where is that? Yep, just your <laughs> controls, bring it up. Yep, and it, what do I have to do? So it would be great if it was like walk up to somebody and just like tap phones and they have your files. But it's a little bit more complicated than that. But once it's set up, it's great. Like it's, wow, we're on, like it, it's just a completely different idea. Like it's it's almost bringing back that, you know, Apple hates the word skeuomorphism. It would be great if they went back and did something a little bit more recognizable. Like, I don't know how exactly uh, I would frame it so that people could understand it, but it's like the best hidden feature on iOS. And I didn't even think about the fact that it's full resolution because that's, of course, what I used it for was to mm -hmm. get my like 5.74 megabyte photos directly to my system when anything else would have required me to compress them down, which is why I initially didn't email them. So they just need to do a better job of advertising that it exists and making it easier to use. There you have it. We like things that are easier to use, so, which actually, oddly enough, is a really good transition. I was fascinated by this story. Um, I lived, uh, I, I worked for my first magazine jobs were in New York City. I worked for Ziff Davis uh, down at One Park Avenue for a bunch of years before I moved out to California to help launch Tech TV, which was EDTV when it started. I went to college in New York City. And uh, there's this omnipresent thing you would see. Uh, there are tens of thousands of New York uh, police department officers uh, and the NYPD. Is, there's tens of thousands of officers. And all of the officers you see on the street, um, you know, or as they would get out of their cars, which became less common as, as cops kind of got out of their cars and spent more time walking the streets, um, they have these massive notebooks that are carried around. And there's this great article uh, on the New York Times. Uh, the officers most used items since the 1800s isn't the gun or the handcuffs, but the handwritten activity log. Now the iPhone app is replacing it, and I had no idea that there was actually a there's a in the in New York Police Department headquarters they actually had a printing department that would print the pages for these and distribute uh, them out. Um, but uh, uh, that is like it is the officers basically are required to log their information. Their supervisors sign off against it, and uh, it's a it's it's a big deal. They are now moving to an iPhone app. Um, so what I didn't know is the NYPD started issuing iPhones to the officers in 2015. There's like 37,000 iPhones used there. There's some security reasons, I suspect, which is why they chose uh, uh, the iPhones. Um, uh, but uh, one of the things that allows the iPhones to allow them to do is search the databases instead of having to use the radio, call the dispatcher. If the dispatcher gets the information, radios it back. And uh, so 
they actually have, you know, there's an app and they will enter in their data directly into the app and that will be all be pulled into a database that will be instantly searchable. And what's crazy is, is NYPD officers are required to keep their old notebooks even after retirement. So, you know, if, if somebody was, if, if, you know, prosecutors can get the information from the officers, if the officers come to court to testify, they're required to bring these notebooks. Um, so, uh, Chief Tasso uh, told the, uh, the New York Times, or I'm going to quote the Times article, uh, the standardized format will allow the department to collect t- clean data instead of assisting through handwritten entries and log booths that varied widely depending on an individual officer's note-taking preferences. Um, since 911 calls are already routed to officers' phones, the dispatcher's 911 information will be bundled into the officer's digital log entry for that call. Um, you know, Frank Serpico, the former police detective who helped expose corruption decades ago, called memo books ineffective monitors of officers because, quote, no cop is going to put anything in his memo book to incriminate himself. Um, so uh, it's an interesting read. And uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, it's kind of wild to think about because this is a massive police force that has been using, uh, you know, working the system the way it has, uh, literally, uh, for well over a hundred years. Um, and, uh, you know, it also gets data as the chief Tesla says out of the lockers and into a database that's searchable. Um, there are some concerns about, uh, about whether or not this is, uh, you know, going to create issues for officers, but, uh, it's an interesting read, uh, and there's a really amazing picture uh, at the uh, top of the article of Sean Mc- Officer Sean McGill's uh, memo book. Uh, he's the first police officer to arrive at the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. That's kind of something he keeps. But those, if you're watching the video right now, that is what it looks like, and yeah, it's a big collection of the covers in there. And uh, it's pretty wild to realize that all of the data collected by the NYPD has traditionally been on these and there's written notes um, in those memo books. So that's pretty wild. <laughs> of course, you know, my it's mind. Also wild to... Sorry, Go ahead. I was just saying my mind immediately goes to this picture of what it will be like when someone who's distraught, who's talking to a police officer about a crime that's been committed and the Every time you offer some information, like, yeah, it just happened about five minutes. Five minutes ago, okay. <laughs> uh, go ahead, go ahead, more. Uh, uh, do you have a description? Like, uh, yeah, I think. Like, uh, do you need a minute? Like, no, I'm not on my phone. I'm taking notes. It looks like I'm texting <laughs> yeah. and ignoring you, but I'm taking no, no, notes. No, not on Instagram. Yeah, no, 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 no. Just keep talking. It's fine. It's fine. I'm recording. I'm just using my voice uh, note app, and I'll just I'll write it down later. I'm actually watching, you know, I'm actually watching a basketball game right now. You can't see the one AirPod that's in. Of course, I have experience with being the only person in a boardroom during a meeting with upper management where I'm on my phone and somebody finally says, what are you doing? I'm taking notes. And this was, you know, in the early days of the iPhone when people didn't realize you could actually be sitting there on a phone like, no, look, it's my notes application. I'm typing everything that you're saying with my thumbs. Yeah. I've I've had that experience where you turned around <laughs> and then held up the notes for someone to look at and they went, Oh, oh, couldn't you use a legal pad? Actual quote. <laughs> right. <laughs> legal pad. Come on. This is two thousand seven. Legal pad. <laughs> I don't even know how to write with a pencil. Oh, I bet it'll just you're rusty. You're rusty. You'll you'll if you work at it. I know. I'll remember. It'll, uh, you'll remember. Anyhow, uh, I uh, I rather enjoyed that. So we shall see how it goes. Oh, uh, one last thing. Don't have a link in the show notes for it. 9to5Mac uh, says that uh, iOS 13.4, the beta, has a car key feature built into it. Um, quote, support for unlocking driving and sharing NFC car keys. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Quote, it seems that Apple is already working with some car manufacturers to implement car key, but it probably won't be available to everyone until iOS 13.4 is officially released. This makes me nervous. That's all I'm going to say. 
I mean, mean Apple's secure. Do you, exactly. do you leave the house without your phone? So I guess that makes sense. Now instead of, okay, wallet, keys, phone, and glasses if you wear them, it'll just be phone, done. Got my digital wallet on the phone. I've got my key built into the phone. I don't need glasses anymore because my phone tells me where to go. And that's I'm it. Sure you're going to need your glasses. Nah. Well, no, once you've got a camera on it. Vehicle. Now, phone's got a camera on it. Right. And then the car drives itself. Glasses will be a thing of the past because people will just like become legally blind by choice. Like, nah. I, I have spent so much time with hackers and security professionals that I just will not put any kind of, of, you know, computerized wireless smart lock on my house. Um, you know, so how about this question of the week? Uh, Twitch email, twitch at twit.tv. If you currently have a smart lock on your home and, uh, whether or not it was a delightful change or, you know, if you even use it anymore, I'm kind of curious about that one. So something to think about. If you're sitting in a car and somebody's commute, you've been stumbling around the internet, if this is the first time you've ever heard the podcast, it's called This Week in Computer Hardware. We call it Twitch. We being Sebastian Peake, editor-in-chief of PCPer.com, and I'm Patrick Norton. I also do a podcast about audio and video, well, entertainment, uh, called AV Excel. And together, we like to talk about the latest news in hardware because there's a lot of it coming out. And uh, we wanted to cause you the least amount of pain and trauma possible. If you've got a question for us, email twitch at twit.tv. Uh, you can also send your tips, your suggestions, your story ideas. Or if you're thinking about a build, you got a question, we'd love to hear it. And uh, also, if this is your first episode of Twitch, go to twit.tv slash T-W-I-C-H where you'll find links to all of our older podcasts. We do video. We do audio. You can search for the links to download or, better yet, subscribe there or just go to your favorite podcatcher and search for This Week in Computer Hardware. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Sebastian Peake. We'll catch you next week on Twitch.